Hello and welcome to Apache Spark Data Kickstart. I'm Dustin Vanoy. I'll be leading you through the videos in this series. The goal is to get you from not really sure what Apache Spark is to being able to develop actual data processing pipelines with it. So that's going to include reading in data, applying transformations and joins, writing different types of data uh, de to destinations that companies are, are using these days. I decided to create this training series because some of the content I use to learn Apache Spark is a bit outdated now. I also have some opinions about the order you should learn these concepts and code syntax in. So full disclosure, I recently started working at Databricks, a company founded by the original creators of Apache Spark. However, all of the thoughts and opinions are my own, and this is not a Databricks specific course. This training is meant to cover Apache Spark fundamentals, regardless of whether you choose to run Spark uh, on Databricks or some other vendor, and where you choose to do the rest of the work for your data ecosystem. Now, I started my role pretty recently, within the last four weeks, so uh, I've used a lot of these options in the past and can speak to them a little bit, but mostly we're going to focus on using Apache Spark, the open source product across whatever environment you choose. So this is going to be a bit of a data engineering perspective because that's my background, and it has a bit of focus on using cloud sources and cloud destinations. Now, if you're worried about getting bored during this video or the rest of them, you can always make a game of it and just take a drink every time I say Spark but I do not recommend that. Okay, so why do we use Apache Spark? We use it because we want a powerful data processing framework that can handle batch and streaming workloads. Often we've started by building some analytics on a relational database or like developing a Python script to process data or maybe train a machine learning model. Now, as we try to run all of the data we've collected through that job, it becomes slow or just crashes because there's too much data. There are many options to address this, but using Apache Spark is one way to solve that problem, and uh, it really opens up the possibility of doing much more data processing than you would have attempted on a single machine. So when we look for a scalable data platform to choose uh, to solve these problems, we want to choose a framework with a lot of community support and enough popularity that we can either get another job using the same skills or find people to hire that already know the technology. So to summarize why we may choose Apache Spark, it's a leader in big data processing space, we can scale out by adding extra machines, whether they're virtual or physical, and it gives us the ability to start relatively small but grow as the data grows or as the complexity grows. This type of cluster computing is a bit uh, complicated to learn, but Apache Spark syntax is fairly easy to, to learn and fairly easy to use. We have several options to get our first cluster running quickly. Let's take a look at that soon. Now, at this point, you may be thinking, that helps me a little. I'm getting there. But what is Apache Spark? So to start with, I need to clarify that there's like two sides of Apache Spark. First, Spark is a programming API, meaning you can import a Spark library and write Spark code. It's also an execution engine and lets you run the code across a cluster of machines to take advantage of processing data in parallel at a large scale. So when we talk about parallel processing or distributed processing or maybe cluster computing, what we're talking about with Apache Spark and many other tools like it is you have a main controller node where applications are submitted. The driver application runs on that controller node and will split up as much of the work as possible and submit smaller tasks onto the worker nodes. Now you may be wondering where did this all come from? So let's talk through that real quick. So Apache Spark was created at UC Berkeley AMP Lab back in 2009 and was open source soon after. As it gained in popularity in 2013, it was moved to Apache Software Foundation, which is an organization that supports many large open source software projects. Spark.apache.org website describes Spark as a unified engine for large-scale data analytics. So to clarify what is meant by data analytics, the official site says that it's used for data engineering, data science, and machine learning use cases. The project has a lot of community use and involvement, which is indicated by having over 2,000 contributors. Okay, so let's keep going with what is Apache Spark. So I tend to describe it as a fast, general-purpose engine for large-scale data processing. It's becoming more common to use it for smaller data jobs also, mostly because of the improvements to file formats and the ease of getting an environment running, even just for temporary jobs. But it's typically thought of for larger data, and you may not see a reason to migrate to Apache Spark if you have small enough data sizes that traditional data systems are handling your needs just fine. Spark has mostly replaced MapReduce as the framework for parallel processing in the Apache Hadoop ecosystem. And if you're, it's okay if you aren't familiar with Hadoop, but if you have heard about it, just know that we often use Spark and cloud services to achieve the same type of benefits that Apache Hadoop can provide. And to be clear, Spark works great with Hadoop and can run on top of Hadoop. So going a bit further on 
uh, running Apache Spark. You have many options to consider. Mostly, it's a good thing to have this choice, but it can be a bit confusing for beginners. Let's start with options for running a Spark cluster. You can choose a standalone cluster, which is a simple native Spark services running on each node of the cluster. Yarn is a resource manager that's used by Hadoop and supports many types of applications. Some of the managed Spark environments are using Yarn, even when there's no other Hadoop tools uh, being used with it. Now you can run Spark on Kubernetes and utilize some of those capabilities for deployment and scaling that you use with other Kubernetes workloads. And don't forget, you can run Apache Spark locally on your single machine, uh, such as a laptop or whatever you use for development. Now you have some choices around languages. Um, Scala and Python are the most popular for working with Apache Spark. You'll find the most tutorials and the most support for those languages. Since Spark runs on the JVM, the, the Java virtual machine that is, you may find performance benefits when running Scala or Java uh, running natively on the JVM. However, if you avoid using user-defined functions, uh, you're not likely to see a performance hit using Python. Other languages that some people use for Spark are R or C Sharp. And another important note is that you can actually write SQL statements that can handle most of the workload. And it's very effective for reading and transforming data, especially once that initial ingestion is complete. So to speak even more to its flexibility, uh, Apache Spark API is made up of several different modules. The one I use most is the SQL module. Uh, and that doesn't necessarily mean that we're writing SQL code, like SQL statements. What it means is that I'm going to work with a simpler data type known as a data frame or a data set. The SQL library will feel more like Python pandas library or working with our data frames. So you can also use data frames for stream processing, which is known as Spark structured streaming. Okay, so if you really want to use panda syntax, you can do that uh, using pandas API for Spark. At times you may need to use the Spark core module directly, but typically uh, using SQL module or one of these others will use the core module under the covers without you having to interact directly. Spark ML lib is for machine learning work, and for those using scikit-learn, I think it feels a bit familiar. But as a data engineer, I often just use whatever the data science team chooses. So at times, I've seen data science teams that have moved from R or some Python libraries to running on a Spark ML lib because they were struggling to get the performance they needed on a single machine. And so finally, there's another specialty library called GraphX, which is for working on graph computation with Spark. Okay. An important part of understanding Apache Spark is this concept of lazy evaluation. Lazy evaluation means Spark doesn't immediately do the work defined by our code. So like, we'll write some code. Uh, it's usually broken into some different steps, maybe some functions and things as we write it. First, we would read in data, then transform values such as converting text to dates, replacing blank values, uh, and many more types of transformations. So we may have filters, we may join tables, so on and so on. So these types of transformations are not going to cause any work until we call a Spark action. A Spark action is something like a command to write files or to print to screen or collect the results into like a list object that we can work with in our program. Before the action takes place, Spark runs as these optimization steps to build up a DAG, which it stands for Directed Acyclic Graph. It determines the order of uh, commands that need to run and how to do this most efficiently based on the data size and cluster configurations. So just be aware that as you run a set of commands uh, and submit them to using the Spark API, they may happen like split second, and you'll be wondering why it's so fast. Often that means you haven't hit an action step yet, so it hasn't actually processed any data. Okay, we made it through a bit of intro. Next I wanna share as briefly as I can about some of the options to run Apache Spark. These are worth thinking about more when standing up Apache Spark for an organization or some type of real project. But to get started, you really just need to pick one. I recommend start practicing on whichever is easiest for you to start with and won't cost you too much money. So the first option I'll cover is Databricks. As I stated in the intro, at the time of recording this, I've been working for Databricks for four weeks. So um, I won't go into selling mode and share all the new information I've learned about Databricks and its features. However, I will describe it, how I've been talking about it prior to joining uh, the company since I've been working with Databricks and other Apache Spark environments for a while. So Databricks is a unified platform for data and AI. Uh, so that's a hint that it's more than just running Apache Spark, but it uses Apache Spark extensively. It runs on one of the three main cloud providers, uh, or you have a community edition, which you can easily spin up your own environment and get started on for learning. And that's probably where I'd point you if you have no uh, experience with Docker, no experience with running Apache Spark yet, spin up Databricks Community Edition, which I'll, I'll have a video that shows you how to do that next, and you can get started there. 
So um, if you're going to run this load in production, you're gonna pick your favorite cloud, Azure, AWS, Google Cloud, and um, deploy a group of resources that's managed by Databricks and you have some control over the security and things like that. Um, and it'll be integrated with your other cloud resources. So ultimately the data can be kept within your cloud environment, secured by you, and, and the clusters and things will run within your own uh, data plane is what it's called. So Databricks includes an optimized Apache Spark runtime that's well aligned with uh, the open source Spark releases. So your code is easy to transfer into Databricks or easy to take out of Databricks and put into another Spark environment. It includes many additional tools, many of them open source to build out your data and AI platform. Now, I, I think this comes up a lot, so I'm gonna share about it real quick. Databricks created the idea of a data lake house around two years ago with a vision of keeping uh, your data in your cloud storage for all your uses, not just for data lake work. So what that means is that this data lake house concept is, uh, and it is off topic for this video, but if you wanna look into it more, you'll get a better feel for like the Databricks vision and how all these different capabilities come together. I'll say that I've used Databricks for running Apache Spark jobs with a wide variety of sources and destinations, so it integrates well with many things. And if you have another data warehouse you know, platform already, you can still use uh, Databricks to run kind of the data lake or data engineering pieces of it. It's like all of these things, it's up to you kind of which features you choose to use and how much you use it for your platform. Okay, now let's talk about uh, the primary Apache Spark options by each of the, the three main cloud providers. So the first I'll cover is one I've used often, which is Azure Synapse Apache Spark. Let me start with the full platform Azure Synapse Analytics. It includes several different ways of working with data beyond Spark. So um, it can cover your data ingestion, querying your data lake with T-SQL using these serverless SQL pools, or loading data to a data warehouse known as a dedicated SQL pool. Specifically for working with Apache Spark though, the Synapse option is used as notebooks and can acquire a uh, compute on a pool of resources. So it can be used for exploration or, sch or scheduled jobs. Synapse Spark tries to simplify a bit of the cluster management for you. So you have some limited options about what node size to use and which Spark versions are available. I do find it's often uh, a preference for teams that are doing a lot of their other work in Azure Synapse Analytics. Um, and you can also submit jobs to Synapse Spark without the notebooks, just to, to make that clear. I haven't personally used this a lot, but I, I do know it's possible and I'm sure there's that people out there doing it and sharing about that. Um, to be clear, this is going to run within your Azure Cloud environment. So you have um, a lot of security that's built into Azure there and some control over the resources that get spun up and, and how they're uh, secured network wise and things like that. Okay, so in AWS, uh, there's an option called EMR, which stands for Elastic Map Reduce. It's a way to spin up a Hadoop environment, which can be used for either running just Apache Spark on Yarn, um, if you don't need any other Hadoop ecosystem services, or you could do more services with it. I've worked with this quite a bit in the past, and it offers quite a few versions of Spark to run and a lot of control of which types of VM instances to use, which is nice. It does spin up in your environment, at least most of the offerings I've worked with do. In my experience, we spend a bit more time just getting the configuration set correctly and automating the correct creation of all the components, um, but I'm sure it has evolved a bit. Some newer features are a serverless option to reduce node configuration, an EMR Studio to give you a more complete developer experience, or you can start with an EMR Notebook uh, and easily create a cluster that it can run on. So I'll point out that it is a pretty inexpensive way to run Spark jobs in the cloud. Um, so it's just probably one of the reasons that's um, used by quite a few AWS customers. So in Google Cloud, there are a variety of ways to run Spark fairly efficiently. You may have heard of Dataproc. It's a managed Spark environment and includes a serverless option now to simplify uh, things for you. It provides auto scaling without any manual provisions or tuning required. In addition though, Google has really tried to make it where you can run Spark wherever your data is. So. Uh, if you're working in BigQuery, you can run Apache Spark uh, right there from BigQuery, um, or you can use Vertex AI Notebooks and call out to Dataproc to run Spark from there. Or even within Dataplex, you can jump into serverless data exploration using Spark SQL or PySpark. Now, I haven't worked a lot with this, um, so I chatted with some Google connections who know Google Cloud well, um, but I encourage you to take a look for yourselves or see what others have shared about it. So that's our intro to Apache Spark. I appreciate you hanging out with me. Um, there's plenty more places you can find out about the background of Apache Spark and why you might use it. Um, so check out the description, check out my blog post for highlights, uh, and links to things that I highlight that are useful. Um, I'll also uh, share some of the things I like about it as we go, some of the benefits of using Apache Spark.
Now the rest of the series will be focused on getting you set up and writing code with Apache Spark rather than trying to explain why we use it. So thanks for joining and don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications so you'll know when I post the next videos for this course. See you next time.